the Lord. Glory to God. Good morning. Good to be in church. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Miss Ingrid, are you in the house? Am I missing her? Am I glossing over? Are we doing something special this morning? No? Next Sunday? Sunday? Okay, great. Praise the Lord. All right, then um, with that, I'd like, uh, Ralph, do you have a microphone? Grab a microphone and come up here. This is Ralph Saul. Let me introduce you to him. Ralph Saul is former military, and I've asked him to come up here and to pray um, over for the families whose loved ones went home to be with the Lord and uh, who perished this last week in Afghanistan, and uh, just felt like it was uh, appropriate to have a military man do the job. Thank you. Before we start, I just want to let you know about the people there. You have to understand, those of you that are civilians, any time a person that's in the military signs the line, they could at any moment give their life, but they give it for freedom for ourselves, and they fight for our country. So we want to honor them, and any of the ones that are here, and any of the ones abroad, Thank you for your service and your commitment. I just want you to know that um, the people that gave their lives, all but one, were in their 20s. There was one 30, one or two year old. So these are young individuals, but they knew what they were heading into, they knew the possibilities, and they did it with honor, and they did it because they loved it. But now imagine if you were to talk to one of their family members, and nothing that you said or no words would be able to heal their hearts or console them, but we know that God can do things that we can't do. So what we want to do now, I want you to join with me and exercise your faith and believing in God's Word as we lift up these fathers and mothers and family members that are grieving at this time. Father God, we do come before you and we thank you that your Word is truth. And I ask that you give these family members the peace that surpasses all understanding. And you are a God that heals the brokenhearted. And in their time of grief and sorrow, you can mend them and let them know that everything will be okay. And that you are turning what Satan meant for evil to your glory and to good. And I just ask, Father, with all those here and online, as we release our faith, that you would touch each and every single person and allow their hearts to be healed. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Thank you. As I go into the message today, I want to talk to you about something that is a little bit out of the ordinary for me. Um, I don't, if you've been here for any time at all, you'll notice that how I minister is I don't minister based on current events. Um, my method of operating in ministry for 20 years now has been hearing from the Spirit of the Lord and then ministering what the Lord places on my heart to minister. And it's interesting because throughout these years, we've seen many, many times how the Lord will prepare us as a body, as a church, for things that are to come. For example, for those of you who were part of our church when we were at the other location, in uh, 2019, New Year's Eve, we got together and prayed. Uh, A few of us came, showed up for, for prayer for that as we'd ushered in the new year. And the Spirit of the Lord revealed something to me, gave me like this vision, and I don't mean it wasn't like I saw it out here, it was just something in my heart. 
And I shared it that night. And I, then it was like the next Sunday, I think, in church. Maybe it was the week after that. The Lord reminded me of it. I kind of kind of forgotten about it and reminded me of it. So I shared it again with the whole body on Sunday morning. And I even said at the time, I don't even know why I'm sharing this with you other than the Spirit of the Lord showed me this. So I believe if he showed this to me and he impressed it upon my heart to share it again with, with everybody that it's, that it's for our church. And what that was, this vision that I had was I was standing on this beach, and as I was standing on the beach, I looked, and it was just dark, ominous cloud, like a rolling cloud, a, a, a front of weather that was coming, and it looked really bad, uh, really dangerous, and scary, if you will. And as I saw this coming, I began to look, and I saw everybody grabbing their belongings and running off the beach to try to run away from this. And I just stood there. And I remember standing there like this. Here's the water, and here's the people running, and here's that dark cloud. And you would think, run, like the rest of the people, because it looked that bad. And yet I just stood. And as I stood, I saw it come, and I saw it go. And as soon as it came, it left, like, swiftly, And I just stood there like this, and it was beautiful, clear skies on the backside of it. And one would think that it was going to be worse because it was like that was the beginning of this bad storm, and it was really going to get bad after that as it came through. But as I watched and people were fleeing, and that dark cloud was just rolling at it was rolling at the pace and rate that they were fleeing, and they were staying in it. And I thought, if you just stand, you won't have to live with it on and on and on. And so I said, listen, I don't know exactly what that's for, but this is what the Lord showed me, and this is what I I share with our church. (laughs) Well, lo and behold, just a short while later, here comes COVID-19. I mean, just, just... few days later, months later or something. Like, I had no idea. never even heard of it. And when that began, I, it, the Lord reminded me, tell your church to stand firm. Hold your ground. Stand firm. No matter what happens, stand firm. No matter what you see, no matter how it affects people around you, Stand firm in what you believe. And having done all to stand, stand therefore. And he talks about the armor of God, how we place that armor of God on ourselves. And so I saw how the Spirit of the Lord prepared me for something and prepared us for something that was to come. And he'll do that. He'll do because he loves, he loves us. He loves his church. He loves the people. And it's interesting that the Lord had directed me, of course, seven weeks ago now to begin ministering and teaching on the power of God, understanding, bringing understanding to the power of God. And then this week, I read an article that was posted in the New York Times. And as I read this article, I read it, at one point I laughed, and another part of me felt like, this is so sad. And I'm going to read to you a part of that article, the first portion of this article that was written this week. It said, The Puritan colonists who settled in New England in the 1630s had a nagging concern about the churches they were building. How would they ensure that the clergymen would be literate? Their answer was Harvard University a school that was established to educate the ministry and adopted the motto, Truth for Christ and the Church. It was named after a pastor, John Harvard. And it would be more than 70 years before the school had a president who was not a clergyman. Well, nearly four centuries later, Harvard's organization of chaplains has elected its next president 
an atheist named Greg Epstein, who takes on the job this coming week. Mr. Epstein's authored a book entitled, Good Without God. He's a chaplain for Harvard University. Mr. Epstein is teaching students, this is still quoting this article, Mr. Epstein is, ch- is teaching students about the progressive movement that centers people's relationship with one another instead of with God. This is sad. This is ungodly. This is humanism, of which I taught on a few weeks ago. This is dangerous for people to believe. And this is, folks, this is the anti-Christ spirit that is behind this. And I have no problem getting up here and sharing that with you. I'm going to read to you some scripture verses, and I want you to just listen. No, don't turn. I'm reading out of Isaiah 64. It says, For we have all become like one who is unclean, and all, all our righteousness, our best deeds and rightness and justice is like filthy rags or polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquity, like the wind, takes us far from God's favor, hurrying us toward destruction. Verse 8 says, Yet, O Lord, you are our Father. We are the clay, and you are the potter, and we all are the work of your hands. I'll read to you what Jesus said when he responded to a young man that came running to him and kneeling down and asked him, it said, good master, what might I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus' response to this young man was, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. Jesus himself said, why callest thou me good? There's one good, and that's God. Let me be clear. Mr. Epstein, (laughs) you don't have good without God. If you're looking for good in humanity, you won't find it. Good has to be learned and taught from the the principles of God himself. Any and all good comes from God Almighty. Now, I have nothing against Mr. Epstein. I want to make that clear also. Nothing against this man or anybody else that believes and thinks like him. (laughs) But... I have everything against his ideals and the garbage that he is teaching to these children. Everything against that. And so we're going to do what we do. And that's pray. I'm going to pray right now for Mr. Epstein and others. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we stand here in Tarpon Springs, Florida, wherever Mr. Epstein is, Lord, we pray for him. And Lord, I pray that the eyes of his understanding are enlightened, that he may see, that he may see where goodness comes from, the source of true goodness, that he would see it, that he would recognize it, and that he would accept the truth. We know from the Word of God, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. 
And Lord, I pray for Mr. Epstein, and I pray for other college professors and university professors, high school teachers, middle school teachers, elementary teachers, all of those in positions of influence and those in positions to teach others. Lord, I pray for a move of the Spirit of God in their very midst, in their belly, and Lord, that there, there be awakening and that they would see they would see truth, they would see life, they would see light in Jesus' name. And any lie, any darkness, any deception that has scaled over their eyes, I pray that they are removed and gone forever in Jesus' name. And I pray for any and all students that they have affected, that they have taught, that they have misled. I pray the same thing for them, that they would see that light, that they would walk in the light and the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray for students that are in Harvard University and those that are in our universities and colleges and high schools and middle schools and elementary schools. And Lord, that there would be a rising up of boldness and courage in Jesus' name. And that they, that godly students, would they would have influence, even influence among their peers and influence among the, the professors. And they would see this boldness and this faith in these students in Jesus' name. That they would be encouraged in Jesus' name. And Lord, we give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise, we turn from our wicked ways, we humble ourselves before you, and we recognize that it is only you that is good. And you teach us, you reveal to us how to walk in your goodness, how to display your love. Lord, I pray that the love of God casts out all fear. And I thank you that you have not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And we can stand in the face of evil. And we don't have to back down. We don't have to bow down. In fact, we refuse to bow down. We know that if, you, if we bow, we burn. <laughs> so we don't bow. We will have no other God before us. Just as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will have no other God before us. And even if we're in the midst of the flame, we know <laughs> we're not alone. But we walk hand in hand with the very presence of God. Now as we go before your word, we open our heart, we open our mind to hear from you, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you helped me to preach and teach this word with accuracy, with boldness in Jesus' name, and that this word comes forth uninterrupted, unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. Lord, I thank you, Father, that signs, wonders, and miracles happen as I'm preaching, and as I'm teaching, and as I'm ministering, and as the Spirit of the Lord is moving and having his way in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Give him glory and give him praise right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Turn in your Bible with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. It's good to see all of you here. Good to have you here. We appreciate you being a part of this ministry, being partners with this ministry. We're so grateful for each and every one of you. Even if I don't know you, I'm grateful for you. Praise to you too. Praise God. Yes, sir. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30 says, God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy. 
and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the Scriptures say, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. If you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. We've adopted a mindset in this church. And the mindset in this church is right in line with the Scripture that says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above, the Father of lights above. So when anything good happens in our life, our response to that is glory to God. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, referring to God, hath made him, who is Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, meaning Jesus, that we, say we means me, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's me, that's you, that's us. We're in him. The scripture says we're in Christ. So we have been made the righteousness of God in him. We have been made the righteousness of God. Not our righteousness. We just read what our righteousness looks like. Looks like filthy rags. But we have been made the righteousness of God in him. We have been made the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let's turn once again to the text that we've looked at week after week. Now, as we read it this week, I kind of want you to think in the back of your mind of that excerpt of that article I read in the New York Times. And I want you to kind of, as I'm reading, go, boy, isn't that interesting that this revelation that came by the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul 2,000 years ago, and yet we're seeing at Harvard University, which was a university that was established to teach clergymen the literal word of God so they would stick to the literal word of God, look at the revelation that was given to us so we can hold to the truth today. Right? Now listen to this. It says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know that it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. <laughs> Doesn't that kind of make you laugh just a little bit? I mean, just like, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. All right, all right, Mr. Harvard, all right. Good without God. Come on, man. Where are you coming from, bro? Let's go. It isn't there. It isn't there. You ever have a baby that didn't say? Mine. You ever, ba ever baby not cry when it's hungry? Or not cry when its diaper needs to be changed, just like, eh, hey, I'm fine. I'm at four. Not a one. Why? Because it's me. Take care of me. Right? Unfortunately, we have some 40, 50, 60 year old babies in the church today. Because they haven't learned, it's not all about me. Well, I don't know why they don't do that at that church. Because it's not about you. That's why, honey. Well, you know, at the old church, we ain't at the old church. We're at this church now. Okay. Hmm. <laughs> So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, 
and the world's brilliant debaters. God has made the, wise, the wisdom of this world look foolish. Since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. <laughs> he has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended and the Gentiles say it's nonsense. But to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. I mean, you can shout amen right there with that. Isn't that good? I love this stuff. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans. And God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strength. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you are, were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. That's why we say, glory to God. God has unified you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure, holy, and freed us from sin. You ever notice how the Bible just preaches itself? <laughs> you just get up here and read the Bible. It's like, glory to God. Can I get an amen? And just read another verse. It's so good. <laughs> so good. Hallelujah. Go to 1 Corinthians 4.19. Laying some stuff down here for you. I always want to encourage you to go back, read these, reread them, study them, meditate on, what, on these scriptures, you know, because you, you, you can't just get it all, just be saying it, you know, once a week you hear it. Go back, meditate on it. Go line upon line, precept upon precept, the Bible says. Okay? It's good. You should be a student of the Word. Amen. You say, well, I'm not good at reading. Hey, can you read stops? You got your driver's license probably. If you got your driver's license, you can read your Bible. In fact, even if you can't pass your driver's test, you can ask the Holy Spirit, who's available to all. Say, Holy Spirit, you, I mean, you know me better than I know me, and you know I'm not, I ain't that good at reading, or whatever, you know, I mean, I don't care. It, 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 don't make an excuse for yourself to not be able to understand the gospel. Because I'm telling you, I've heard this. I'm not good at this. I'm not good at that. I fall asleep when I do this. I fall asleep. Ask the Holy One, the Holy Spirit, the author of the book to reveal to you what you need from the book. In fact, the author of the book, he's in you. How's that? Well, I don't understand what the Bible. Ask the author. He's inside of you. So Lord, reveal this to me. I mean, this, this is like reading Chinese whatever, you know, to me. But just reveal to me, and he'll reveal it to you. He'll reveal himself. It is his great will to reveal to you who he is, who the Father is, who Jesus is. And it'll begin to unfold for you, and you'll begin to understand, and things will be revealed, and you'll get it on another level and understanding. And I, even if you've been in church your whole life, I'm telling you, God can reveal things to you. you. None of us have exhausted the depths and the breadth of who God is and his wisdom and understanding. There's a whole universe out there, and God's like, I, you, you, I, let me, I want to reveal even more to you. 
There's things in this earth that God wants to reveal to his church. There's things in this earth going on right now that the Spirit of God wants to reveal to his church. And you know why he wants to reveal to the church? Because the church has the power and authority to actually do something about it. That's worth coming to church for right there. Amen. Amen. 1 Corinthians 4.19 But I will come and soon if the Lord lets me and then I will, I'll find out whether these arrogant people just give pretentious speeches or whether they really have God's power. <laughs> For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Let's read that together. Ready? For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Now, should we just settle for a lot of talk? Never. (laughs) Never. We should have an expectation for the power of God in our life. Amen? And let me make this point. This isn't expecting someone else to operate in the power of God on your behalf. Do you hear me? This isn't expecting someone else to operate in the power of God on your behalf. That will happen and that can happen, but the expectation should be in your own heart and in your own life where the, where the power of God is concerned. Okay? Well, pastor, you know, if you'll just pray. Not just if I pray. How about you praying? I'll pray, but it's not up to me. I'm not the one. He's the one. You can make a draw on the power of God just as easy as I can do it. And he desires for you to. He desires for you to call upon him. To expect the power of God in your life. It gives him great joy. Amen. I mean, do you agree that we, the church, should depend on the power of God for our life? Do you, do you, think, um, do you think it's okay for us to expect the power of God? I mean, actually the power of God? All right, I'm at the right place. Good. Want to make sure? <laughs> One more question. Do you think it bothers God? Do no. no. you think it's like we're kind of like nagging him? No. Like when we expect the power of God? Let me, let, me, let, me get, let me bring a natural kind of example. Just a natural fun example. Electricity, right? We call it the power company. Do you think Duke Energy or Progress Energy, whatever they're called out here, power plant, I've, I've used this as an example for a number of weeks. Do you think when you flip the light on in your house, they go, oh, there they go again. I mean, they just expect the power 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Are you kidding me? Or do you think that they built that facility to generate that power at that nuclear power plant, put all the infrastructure in and expect people to use their power. Well, God sent his son Jesus in this earth so that the church of Jesus Christ could walk and live in the authority of the name of Jesus and that we would bind things on this earth and we would loose things on this earth and that we would cast out demons We would speak with other tongues, and we would tell the devil what's up. Not the devil telling the church what's up. Amen? So don't think for some reason that it bothers God when you expect the power of God in your daily life. He takes great pleasure in seeing his power used in the earth. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, last week... I, we looked at some things. Go with me over to Matthew chapter 16, verse 19. Last week, we looked at two very powerful things that a believer can do, that a child of God can do. You remember what they are? Believing 
the Word of God and speaking the Word of God or speaking words of life and faith. Okay? Two very powerful things, not the only things, but two powerful things that a child of God can do is believe the Word of God and speak the Word of God or speak words of life and faith. Amen? And I'm not just talking about positivity. Okay? Mr. Epstein, <laughs> positive's good, but this isn't just about positivity, people. I want to make that very clear. This is, this is speaking words of faith and life that agree with the Word of God, which is positive. But I'm not, it's not just this, you know, oh, I believe in a higher power of positivity. Okay, God bless you, but where in the world does that come from? What's the source of that? Well, the universe. Oh, the universe. Okay. Where did that come from? <laughs> Get what I'm getting at. Okay. You got to have it based on the creator. In the beginning, God. You believe that? We're good. Amen. <laughs> Not too hard on you, all right? I mean, you can handle it. It's second service, all right? I was hard on first service, but man, we had one of the most powerful services this morning that I've ever had. I went to walk off the stage, and I just, I just went broken in tears. Was just like the presence and the power of God was so powerful, was so awesome. Woo! Just be excited. Hallelujah. Matthew 16, 19, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Say the keys. I heard uh, a minister talk on this. He was breaking down this and giving understanding what this meant. He said, keys represent authority. Keys represent legal access. He said, keys represent authority, and keys represent legal access. Okay? And look at here, look what he says. He says, I have given unto thee the keys of the kingdom of of heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, let me read the New Living Translation. I like the way this reads as well. It says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Now, Jesus here is talking about this, and he says this word heaven. This re heaven that he's referring to isn't the heaven where God resides, okay? Because in the Bible, it describes, the, uses the word heaven, and it describes three different actual areas or regions, all right? This heaven that is being referred to here is or you could call it the heavenlies, is the arena or the spiritual arena where forces, spiritual forces, are operating and doing battle. Okay? This heaven that he's referring to is talking about a spiritual battle zone or a spiritual arena that is in the atmosphere. Okay? So when he's talking about, I've given you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Heaven meaning in this spiritual domain, in this spiritual realm. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven, in this spiritual atmosphere, this battleground, this arena, where, this, where, the, where the Apostle Paul calls the spiritual wickedness in high places. Pastor Angie taught on this at Women of Wisdom on Monday. If you didn't hear that, you should listen to that online. It'll bless your life. Praise God. God is given us power to bind the wicked spirits in heavenly places and loose angelic powers and the angelic power of God to work on our behalf in that arena. That's why I said two of the most powerful things you can do as a child of God is to believe and to speak. Because as you speak, 
you speak, you release, and you give authority, you authorize angelic beings to go to work on your behalf in this heavenly region and domain. You have authority, keys, legal access into this realm. Go to Philippians 2.9. Well, I thought I was just coming to a church just, you know, for a little bit and just hear a good little positive message, and I was on my way to Waffle House. <laughs> nope. Philippians 2.9. Hey, we are in a real battle. And I have a responsibility to give you the understanding of, of this battle that's going on. And I have the responsibility and privilege to tell you that you have keys. You have authority. You have power in the name of Jesus. You as a child of God. The Bible says that you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Right? And that the Spirit of God comes and dwells in you. See, you got to know that all this craziness going on on earth, I mean, come on, you see it? You know what's going on? We don't just have to sit there and go, oh, Nelly, I don't know what God's going to do about this one, but it's a big one. But I, you know, God, God, you know, he, he's got it all in control. God's in control. God's in control. God's in control. No. I know right there. Some people are going, well, yeah, I've heard that my whole life. God's gonna... And I'm not insinuating God's out of control. But if all you do is say, well, God's in control, God's in control. Do you, can you imagine if Jesus adopted that mentality? I just think about that. If Jesus himself would have adopted that mentality. Well, God's in control. I guess if he wants those demons out of there, he'll cast them out himself. If he wants those people healed, he'll heal himself because God's in control. No, he went and cast out the demons and he went and laid hands on the sick and they got healed. We just got to be cautious of these, these Christianese sayings that we've allowed ourselves to just kind of come in and go, well, yeah, God's in control. Oh, thank God he's in control. Again, I'm not insinuating he's out of control, but what it does is if you adopt to that, and that, that mindset, then you just stand over here on the sidelines and you watch all this wickedness and the wickedness that's going on in the heavenly realm, and all the while you're sitting there with the keys right in your pocket. Then you, but when you come to a church like this, and you go, wait a minute. I've got the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I want in. And I'm going to do something about this. I'm not going to stand out here and bawl and scrawl and quiet, cry and want, scratch my head and wonder why all is gone. And then just go, well, I guess just God's in control. No, I'm going to get in the game. I'm going to get in the fight. I'm going to get right in the middle of the battle. And I'm going to use the spiritual authority that God himself has given to me. I got the keys because he gave me the keys. He gave me the authority. And therefore, I'm not going to just watch my kids go to hell. I'm not going to watch all these kids overdose. I'm not going to watch this happen. I'm not going to let this fear come into our company. I'm not going to let this fear come into my family. I'm not going to let this sickness just do whatever it wants to do in my family. I have spiritual authority over those that are in my household, okay? And the devil just doesn't get to do whatever he wants to do in my house. Amen. This takes a stirring up on the inside of you. I know this is bold. I know this is big. But I'm just telling you, church, we've got to wake up to the spiritual reality. And we've got to understand the power. Yeah. Hallelujah. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's power and authority in the word of God. We've got to walk in this. God wants us to walk in this authority and this power. He hates to see his children suffering. And people argue, oh, you know, suffering's in the Bible. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, authority's in the Bible, too. Why don't we have to talk about that? I've suffered enough. Hallelujah. Got a little excited, sorry. Whew. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Of things in earth, and th if, if, excuse me, things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. 
Where? Yeah. Things in heaven? Well, that's that heavenly realm we're talking about, right? Things on earth? Well, we're here on this earth. And things under the earth. Well, who's under your feet? Who's under your feet? Satan's under your feet. Well, why is he under your feet? Because of the name of Jesus. Because of what Christ did at Calvary. And he put them under our feet. And we got to remind ourselves where he's at. Don't let him, his head roar up and make you think he's bigger than, he's just, you know, he's a liar. The Bible says he's a liar and he's the father of lies. And he's described as being deceptive and subtle. Deceptive and subtle. You hear me? There's a lot of deceptive and subtle things happening in the earth today. Yeah. And it, I'm okay if you want to know about it. I mean, okay if you want to study about it. But as soon as you hear and learn about it, take the keys out of authority and begin to speak against it in the name of Jesus Christ. Because at the name of Jesus, all those plots and schemes and plans and tricks and wiles of the devil can be exposed and brought into the light. That's our prayer. That's my wife and I's prayer. That every clever, wild trick of the devil, every plot, every scheme is exposed and brought into the light, saw, sought out, found, discovered, and spoiled in Jesus' name. Everything that's coming against our family, everything that's coming against your family, our church, our church body, that we see it ahead of time. We know ahead of time. God prepares us ahead of time. And we pray, we speak against it, we believe. Because that's powerful. That's what we can do. We need to do what we can do. We need to don't do what we're authorized to do. Let him do the heavy lifting. We do what we're called to do. Amen? Believers have total authority over the power of Satan. <laughs> we can sit back and just talk about what the devil is doing all day long. But what did we read? It's not in a lot of talk, but in the power of God. Amen? Amen? We can take authority over evil spirits that are trying to destroy, destroy you, destroy your family, destroy your community. We can take authority over them in the name of Jesus, and we can do what the Scripture says. We can pull down strongholds. Things that have been fortified by the enemy, and they may have been fortified for generations. There are things that the enemy has done to try to bring fortification in your family. They call it generational curses, people call it. That curse is broken when one born-again believer exercises their authority in the name of Jesus. All those strongholds for generations can be broken off your family. Yeah. Say this, the curse, the curse. does not run no. in my family, my family. any longer. The blessing of God, blessing of God. Flourishes, flourishes from generation, from generation. to generation, generation and for a thousand generations <laughs> if the Lord tarries. You just set it in motion right there. You, set, you believe, you set that in motion right there. Alcoholism, done. No more identified in your family. No more. You're free from it. Your kids are free from it. Your grandkids are free from it. Gone. Gone. The only addictive characteristics in your family are that to that addiction to Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God, the love of God, the power of God, the peace of God. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. You know, we are the ones whose prayers change offices of authority. Our prayers change offices of authority. Our prayers. We're, we're the ones. Say we're the ones. <laughs> we're the ones that need to intercede on behalf of those who are in authority. Amen? We're the ones that operate and use the power of God 
in our land. We're the ones. Amen? We're the ones that after, <clears throat> after when we see all what's going on in the earth and what's going on around us, we're the ones that, that, that yield to the Spirit of God, hear from God, call out to God, call on the authority of God, and we see results. We're the ones. Say to someone sitting near you, you're the one. Josh, you're the one. Brian, you're the one. Amen? Well, go ahead, Pastor. Go ahead, get, get them. Sick them. I'll be in the back. No, you're the one. Oh, you know, the devil doesn't want that. The devil wants people in general to think that there's only a few that really have authority. When in all actuality, we all have authority. And that's why last week when we read, we having the same spirit of faith. Well, who was he referring to? Remember? David. Who's David? He's the young little shepherd boy who walks up scratching his head to bring his brother some lunch. But that spirit of faith that was in him was greater than the natural physical strength of Goliath. And folks, that was a spiritual battle. You have to win the battle in the spiritual realm before you ever win the battle in the natural realm. And you don't look at the natural realm to tell you if the tide is turning. Don't look at the natural and go, oh, it must not be working. You know what you do? You're retracting. You're pulling back. You're not leaving the authority and power in place. You're pulling back. If you only look at the natural to be your barometer, to tell you if it's working or not, you're looking at the wrong thing. This is exactly why the prophet, remember when he was surrounded by the enemy in the Old Testament in the book of Kings, and there's a young man with him, and the enemy, the, the, the king had sent out the whole army to kill one man, one prophet of God, one man who was hearing from God. Did you hear me? One man who was hearing from God sent a whole army. Isn't that something? Do you see how important you are? When the enemy sent an entire army to go take out one prophet, and they wait, the young man wakes up in the morning and he looks around about, and what's around him? The enemy, the enemy's army, surrounding them. They're in this valley, they look around. Oh my goodness. What's he do? He runs back in the tent, tells Elijah, hey, hey, we're surrounded. We're surrounded. You know what he does? Fear not. He says, there be more that be with us than be with them. He's going, okay. He lost his noodle. He, he, he doesn't know what's outside this tent. You know, he probably was a little bit like, no, no, wait, I'm telling you, we're surrounded by the enemy. They're all here for us. We're done. It's over. And the prophet says, Lord, open this young man's eyes. Open his what? Eyes. Whoa. What, what eyes is he talking about? Spiritual eyes. Do you have spiritual eyes? You have the spiritual ability to see. That's why I'm telling you, you don't look at the natural. You don't look at the natural. And I know we're trained. We've grown up. You say, well, that's all there is. Oh, it's not the, uh, there isn't. That's not all there is. You have to come to that understanding. There's more than what you can see with your eye. That's why you, he says, bind things in heaven, earth, authority, heaven, earth, under the earth. You can see things by the Spirit of the Lord that you need to see. 
You know what reveals things to you? The Word of God. You say, how is that? Because words paint pictures. God's Word paints a picture in your mind's eye, in your spirit, of victory, of healing, of truth, that I'm an overcomer, that I'm the righteousness of God. You ever feel like a bum? I mean, you just feel like a low-down, dirty scoundrel sometimes, you know, maybe just, didn't, just kind of mad at yourself. And then you can read what we read this morning. God made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. And all of a sudden, that image that you just had of yourself before, it changes. Because now you have an image of righteousness on the inside of you. And that image on the inside of you is greater than anything you can see on the outside of you. And they can tell you're a loser. They can tell you you're no good, that you, you know, this, that, and the other. But you can go back to the Word of God and let the Word of God paint a new picture yet again and reveal yet again, and reveal yet again who you are in Christ Jesus. And you can walk and not be afraid. You can live at peace, joy, and you're not worried about what's going on in the world around you. In fact, now what you're doing is now you are deployed understanding that you have authority. And that authority is one thing, most definitely, that your enemy doesn't want you to know that you have. And if you know you have it, he hopes you just keep your mouth shut. <laughs> well, you don't keep your mouth shut about other stuff, so why keep your mouth shut about the things of God? Did you get something out of this? Stand to your feet, please. Hallelujah. Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, there's so much for us to learn and know, isn't there? Man, oh man. You know, I'm encouraged because I believe this church is getting a hold of some things, walking in some things. Some of you are being reminded of some things that you've heard and learned in your past and your life. And you're, going, you're being encouraged going, you know what? Yep. I'm going to start opening my mouth. I'm going to start speaking and declaring God's word over my family, over my, over my marriage, over my children, over, you know, I don't know who it might be. Could be an employee, could be a, a coworker, could be your boss, doesn't matter. Could be your kid's teacher, <laughs> right? Let's let the love of God be demonstrated through our life. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you, Father, for your word. Lord, you showed me something in first service, Lord. And it was about that shaking. And you showed me it's like a vibration and it's a vibration that Paul and Silas experienced when they were in that jail cell in the very lower parts of that jail cell and that vibration not only on the night before their supposed execution, that vibration not only opened the doors of that prison, but that vibration caused the chains and the shackles to fall off of them. And Lord, I see that there is a, a vibration happening <laughs> in this church. It's happening on the inside of the believers of this church. And it's, it's the spirit of almighty God. It's the power of God. And as we speak and our vocal cords vibrate, we release this power of God out of our mouth. 
and we'll see things that have tried to hang on to our lives begin to fall off just as those chains fell off Paul and Silas. And things that have hold you back, held you back, things that have been closed as you speak and your vocal cords vibrate, they will, doors will be open. Things will begin to happen in front of you and around you, for you and not against you. Before things were happening against you, now things are going to begin to happen for you. And even as you speak and your vocal cords vibrate, it's going to cause healing in relationships, healing even in your physical body. And where there's hurt and there's hurt feelings, there's emotions that have been hurt and there's been scars that literally as you speak faith and love and life that the evidence of those hurts the scar tissue is going to dissolve and be gone inside of you and it's going to bring freedom to you that you haven't experienced in years and years and years some of you will say I didn't know I could heal this well you thought that that would be something that would remain with you for the rest of your life but it'll be gone it'll be gone it'll be gone thank you Jesus 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 praise you Jesus Praise you, Jesus. Just lift your hands and say this with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus, for dying on the cross, for raising from the dead. Jesus, I make you the Lord of my life. From this day forward, I will live for you. I commit my life to you. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Baptize me with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. I thank you, Lord, that I'm saved and I'm spirit-filled. In Jesus' name, any pain, any hurts, any sorrow, is gone from my life. I walk and I live in the love of God and it casts out all fear. I have the peace of God. I have the love of God. I am filled with the Spirit of God. I have the victory in Jesus' name. Give him praise and glory and honor. Oh, la 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 ma si andere, ci alla la cosson de la ma corre andere. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Wow. God is faithful, isn't he? Thank you, Lord. If for any reason you have the thought that your need needed to be mentioned from this pulpit, 
I want to encourage you with the truth that God knows your need even if it wasn't spoken from this pulpit today. There's some things in my spirit that some people are dealing with in this room. But the Spirit of the Lord specifically directed me, don't say anything about it. Just tell them, I know about it. Praise God. Praise God. I know about it. Thank you, Lord. Love himself knows. Love himself knows. Praise God. At this time, I'm going to ask those who are scheduled to be up here to pray if you'll come forward if you're here and you would like prayer for your life for someone maybe you know that needs prayer you want to come forward and we'll pray with you for them you can come out of your seat and come down here Ralph and Joanne Jeff and Roxanne would you make yourselves available this morning over here please go over there All right. Praise God. These couples are down here to pray with you. Join their faith with you. You know, folks, we believe in the power of God and miracles. This isn't just lip service up here. We release our faith and expect miracles. Okay? And we see them. (laughs) We experience them. It's awesome. It's awesome. See the power of God move people's lives. Woo, glory. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being part of this church. It's a great honor to be your pastor. If I'm not your pastor and you attend somewhere else, it's an honor to minister to you. And uh, just know that you're loved. When you come here, you're always loved. We love you. I want you to remind you that you're the head and not the tail, above and not beneath, blessed going in and blessed going out, and that everything you set your hands to prospers. You're the lender, you're not the borrower, you're good looking and you're dismissed. God bless you. Thank you, Jesus.